Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to NTSO's third in a series of five webinars on the state and federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar focuses on the economic and fiscal issues. My name is Arturo Perez, and I will be moderating the webinar today. I am the director of NCSO's State Services Division. NCSO is committed to providing our members with timely responses to state research requests and the essential knowledge needed to guide state action. This webinar is intended to provide an update on what states should expect from the federal stimulus, state legislative responses to the pandemic, and a national economic update. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free to type your questions and ask any questions in the chat box, which is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. I want to brief briefly mention the resources. Above the presentation, you will see the tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint. Another tab is labeled speaker, where you can read the bios of today's speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NTSL's website within the week. NCSL has developed a web page to house our comprehensive resources on state and federal responses to the COVID-19. The web page can be found at ncsl.org. Here you can find information on state policies and responses related to the continuity of government, education, fiscal, elections, criminal justice, and other important considerations during this unprecedented time. Our upcoming webinars over the next few weeks will cover these policy issues. Today we have three presenters who will share their insights and knowledge with us. Remember to click on the speaker tab to read their bios. On deck first is Erlinda Doherty, who is Committee Director, Budget and Revenue in NCSL's Washington, D.C. office. She will discuss what states should expect from the federal stimulus bill going through Congress as we meet. Erlinda? Yes, good afternoon, friends. This is Erlinda Doherty again, um, the Director of the Budgets and Revenue Committee uh, for NCSL's State and Federal Affairs Division located in Washington, D.C. Hope you are well and safe and uh, healthy. And uh, as you know, we are working on your behalf here to, to try to get as much support as we can um, from the federal government to, to help um, you all battle um, this epidemic, this pandemic that we're all experiencing here on the front lines. We know that truly um, the partnership with the federal government, um, you know, can help and, and give you the resources that you need um, to, to make this, um, to, to, to deal with these challenges. So thank you again for your time today. And just a little bit about me. I, um, I've been with NCSL now for about a year, but do you ha or, but am empathetic of your situation as I did work on the Senate Finance Committee of South Carolina um, as a, a fiscal analyst for close to five legislative sessions. So I'm very familiar with, with what you're handling or dealing with right now with respect to budgets and prioritizing and trying to figure out how we're going to, to make it work um, here um, from a fiscal and revenue perspective over the course of the year. So anyways, um, so as you can see here, we're going to be discussing the federal response for COVID-19 um, impacts and the stimulus package that was um, just approved um, minutes ago, uh, maybe an hour ago, um, on the, the floor of the House. Um, this is what we've been calling phase three of the stimulus package. Phase one, of course, was passed, I guess, about two weeks now, 10 days ago now, can't remember, Groundhog Day, um, which basically was the, the first phase, phase one, which, which dealt with the emergency relief um, providing, um, you know, uh, FEMA and um, our health care resources um, that we needed to sort of immediately provide relief for this for the virus. Phase two uh, was passed, I guess, last week. Again, the day is kind of running, running to one another, um, which, which provided provisions for more individuals, for workers, um, sick leave, um, paid sick leave, as well as unemployment insurance. So phase one was sort of the, the relief. Phase two was more dealing with individuals. And now today, um, just passed literally, uh, again, an hour ago, is what we've been calling phase three of the stimulus package, which tried to do more broader economic relief um, as well as some other health relief provisions for, for the country as a whole and included um, direct payments, 
um, to, to, to citizens, as well as what we're going to get into right now, which is, um, you know, economic um, stimulus for states. So as you can see here on this slide, um, the, the, the act now that it's been enacted is the Corona uh, Virus Aid, Relief, and uh, Economic Securities Act, or what we call the CARES Act. And it uh, provides $150 billion to states, territories, local and tribal governments to use for expenditures incurred um, during this COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the face of revenue declines and allocated by population proportions. Um, the Senate version was passed. Uh, earlier this week on t the 25th March, and today literally my slide has, hadn't been updated, but was it was still uh, on the floor when I sent these over this afternoon. House did just now pass it, and the president uh, either is either signing it now or is enacting it now as we speak. Um, we are expecting Treasury in some form to provide more guidance as to how the um, the monies will be allocated. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of that a little bit later as we go on the presentation. So this is a, a, you know, a good win or good support for the states that we all worked very hard on at NCSL in conjunction with our other big seven organizations to make sure that states had the funds necessary to address this um, unprecedented pandemic, which again, we all know that on the front lines you all are addressing on a daily basis. Um, other major um, provisions of the CARES Act are as follows on this slide here. You can see $45 billion for the Disaster Relief Fund, which um, goes into to FEMA, the Federal Management, uh, Management Agency, Emergency Management Agency, um, for the immediate needs of state, local, tribal, and territorial um, governments. Uh, $30 billion for an education stabilization fund for states and school districts and institutions of higher ed for costs related to the coronavirus. I'm sure a lot of this, again, hits home, especially since we have um, children that we're all trying to homeschool as well. So, you know, another major provision here for states to use um, for flexibility purposes, purposes in that respect. And then $4.3 billion for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to provide um, more support to federal, state, and local public health agencies to prevent and prepare for um, this pandemic. So these are sort of the four main pillars, I would say, of, of monies that are going to the states through various channels um, and in the hopes that you all have the resources that you need to deal with this, with this pandemic. Um, on this next slide here, it's a little small, but I was about the only sort of infographic or uh, I guess pictorial um, delineation of how the monies have been spent or will, will go. Um, it came from um, Bloomberg and was based on the Senate version or the Senate Finance Committee version um, of the legislation that was approved a couple days ago. Again, it's sort of very high level and broad, but you can see here, and I'm sure there will be much more, uh, many more, um, you know, graphs and, and data points and more analyses as the days go on, but as, as sort of a, a large overview, um, this slide does kind of show you in pictorial form where the monies are going. And you can see there right on the lower right-hand corner is the $150 billion that we are all talking about here, the state and local stimulus funds. Okay, next slide. So. As I mentioned earlier, um, the CARES Act does provide these monies for states. The distribution uh, is based on population, and uh, no state is, um, will be receiving less than $1.25 billion. The payment is for fiscal year, or in fiscal year 2020. 45% of the state's funds are set aside for local governments with populations that exceed 500,000, with certified requests going to the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. Certification requires a signature by the CEO of the local government that uses the funds and uh, will be cons will consistent with certain requirements. Um, again, as you, can three, 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 as you can see, three billion is set aside for the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa, and eight billion dollars is for tribal governments. Funds can be used for costs that are necessary expenditures incurred due to COVID-19 were not accounted for in the budget most recently approved as of the date of enactment of this section and were incurred during the period that begins on March 1st and ends on December 30th of 2020. Our initial assessment in NCSL is that the remaining 45% after the localities have received their share would revert back to the state. So yes, as you can imagine, there are issues with the funds that we're all 
um, dealing with as we speak. Again, this is a very fluid situation. The bill was literally enacted you know, within the last couple hours. And even as that was happening, though, we, uh, we at NCSL had been engaging with um, our fiscal folks in, in Denver, as well as our um, organizations that do represent fiscal, offer, fiscal officers, the treasurers, and all of our fiscal um, and budget folks around the country to sort of address what the issues are that we see with the funds um, going forward. And I tried to lay them out here. Of course, there, there could be more, and we would love to hear what those are, um, you know, in, at the end of this presentation. Or, and you can also email me and, and Mandy Rafool um, directly in Arturo. But what, what we see so far are, um, so the questions that we have include, you know, will these funds address the expected loss in revenues um, versus COVID-19 expenses? Um, yes or no? Is that, you know, um, how are we addressing the loss in revenues, the expected losses, or are these actual for, for what we consider to be operational expenses? And just I have in, in parentheses there, the, there was a House version that was being floated around earlier uh, this week before the House decided to adopt the Senate version, where we were actually going to be given $200 billion. So I think there, there was definitely um, a knowledge and an acknowledgement of the fact that this, these funds may not or can't possibly um, cover all of the expected revenue losses um, from the movement of the, of the deadline and also of the tax filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th, but also just the, the, the slamming of the tax bases that all states are going to feel as a result of our economy basically coming to a standstill. Um, the next issue is really truly how flexible are these funds, um, and that kind of ties back again to this um, notion of what is going to be allowed to be covered um, with the application of these funds. Um, how are we going to be able to use these funds in the current fiscal year if we need to? Uh, what about states that have already passed their budgets? There are a handful or maybe more than a handful of, of states that had already passed their budgets or had adjourned for this the session before this emergency had impacted us. And again, other additional issues. So please know that we are considering and um, analyzing all of the issues here uh, and, and trying to make sure that these, these issues are um, being raised and, and uh, voiced uh, to the administration now that the, the bill has been passed, um, and we are taking all this into consideration, both big seven-wise, both within our organization and, and as well with the administration. So um, we are thinking about you all as this is happening, but do hope that, uh, that, that this, these monies can be used to help address um, the, the pandemic and the, the you know, negative impacts that, that this virus is having um, at your states right now. Um, again, um, my name is Erlinda Doherty, and uh, any questions, please feel free to, to contact me or anyone on this, um, this uh, panel discussion today. And uh, again, we are here to, to represent, to work for you, to give you all the tools that you need to the best ability that we can, and to be the voice for the states and the territories um, before the federal government during this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, for a great presentation. A reminder, we will have time for questions at the very end of the webinar. Our next presenter is Erica McKellar, who is a program principal in the Fiscal Affairs Program of NCSL. She will cover legislative responses to the COVID-19 crisis regarding budget actions. Erica. Thank you, Arturo and Erlinda. So we here in the Denver office have been trying to keep tabs on um, the legislative fiscal uh, issues that uh, COVID-19 is bringing up and uh, fiscal responses in the states. And um, one of the most immediate responses we've seen are legislatures taking steps to ensure agencies and departments have the funding that they need to combat the outbreak. Um, nine states have enacted supplemental appropriation bills and another 19 bills are moving through legislative channels. Um, five states have authorized transfers from their rainy day funds for issues relating to COVID-19. Um, and again, we have some more rainy day fund transfer bills in the works. A couple of states are working on creating special funds related to COVID-19 responses. And we've seen some other states draw on other emergency and reserve funds for their responses. Um, a lot of states have suspended their sessions right now. Uh, but we expect more movement on some of these bills whenever they're able to reconvene. 
So obviously there's a lot of uncertainty right there out, out there right now. Economies in the states are largely at a standstill. Uh, non-essential businesses are shuttered. Bars and restaurants are closed or operating at a limited capacity. And the shutdown will obviously have a huge and potentially long-lasting impact on state revenues. Um, unfortunately, there are so many unknowns about how long these economic shutdowns will last and what the subsequent economic recovery will look like, that it's really difficult for states right now to accu accurately estimate um, what their revenues will be for the next fiscal year. Uh, several states are scheduled to revise their revenue estimates in April and May, uh, which will still be very early to try to get a handle on what the full revenue impact will be. Um, those estimates might be complicated by some of the extended tax filing deadlines that we're seeing the states enact. Um, in some states, it could push revenue they expected to receive in fiscal year 2020 into fiscal year 2021. Uh, that said, states are really trying to get a handle on potential revenue losses from this whole situation. Um, and so far, the estimates that we've seen for reduced revenues in fiscal year 2020 and 2021 are significant. Um, just to name a few examples, uh, oh. Looks like we, sorry, let's uh, go back to the correct slides here. All right, sorry about that. Um, Vermont is projecting a 15 to 17% reduction in total fiscal year 2020 revenues. California is anticipating several billion dollars less in capital gains revenues. Um, Colorado hasn't yet yet passed a fiscal year 2021 budget, but the Colorado Legislative Council recently estimated a potential $900 million shortfall based on budget proposals before the legislature suspended its session. Um, and that was before changes were made to the operation of retail bars and restaurants in the state. Uh, Washington State is currently working on determining what a 12 to 15 percent drop in GDP could mean for state revenues. And in New York, which begins its fiscal year on March 1st, uh, revenues could be $7 billion less than they had anticipated. So some significant revenue impacts um, coming down the pipeline for states. Um, every state is vulnerable to this economic slowdown in different ways. Um, states more reliant on sales tax revenues are taking an immediate hit right now as people stay home. Um, but I think that states relying on tourism will see a significant revenue decline. Um, Hawaii was projecting at least $340 million less for the remainder of their biennium before quarantine measures and other procedures went into effect. Um, and states reliant on revenues from oil production could take a significant hit. Uh, Alaska revised their revenue estimate to assume a $40 price tag on a per, per barrel of oil. Um, that's down from earlier assumptions of $59, which uh, could result in a reduction of $550 to $600 million in revenue. Uh, North Dakota based its budget on a $40, $48 per barrel uh, price of oil. And to put that in context, oil prices earlier this week were at about $28 per barrel. So oil producing states could face some major challenges going forward if that trend continues. Of course, um, revenue reductions are only part of the equation. States are taking measures to support businesses that have had to close or reduce operations and expanded benefits for workers. Um, and those could cost states significantly. In Washington state, for example, during the first week of March, new unemployment claims were at 7,000. And last week, um, that jumped to more than 133,000 new claims. Um, so there are some significant spending pressures coming down the pipeline for states. And long story short, States will see expenditures rise as revenues are reduced. Um, one other challenge that I'll just briefly touch on is that all of this is happening um, while states are negotiating their fiscal year 2021 budgets, which has uh, resulted in some procedural issues for states. Um, about half of states have already enacted their fiscal year 2021 budgets, and those were largely based on revenue estimates well before the virus was affecting the United States. Um, so we'll see a lot of special sessions when um, it's safe for states to meet to, to revise those, um, <clears throat> those budgets. Several states were in the middle of their sessions and they have either adjourned with containing resolutions in place or they've suspended their sessions in the hopes that they can uh, meet before the start of the fiscal year, which begins on July 1st for most states and um, enact either full budgets or um, partial funding. Um, 
finally, uh, another challenge that uh, we'll see on the horizon for states is that as these stay-at-home orders are lifted and the economy begins to normalize, states will likely be looking for more ways to support businesses and workers and jumpstart their economies. And again, they will have um, less revenue to support those efforts. Um, obviously, this is evolving day by day, and we'll be keeping tabs on state fiscal situations on our website. Um, my contact information is on the screen. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or any of our colleagues in the Fiscal Affairs Program. We are always here to answer any of your questions and provide any information that we can during this uncertain time. Thank you, Rogero. Thank you, Erica, for that excellent presentation. Again, we are taking questions already on the uh, audience chat box. We will go on to our next presenter in the interest of time. Our next presenter is Dan White, Director of Government Consulting and Fiscal Policy Research with Moody's Analytics. Dan will provide the latest economic assessment and outlook regarding the U.S. economy. Dan? Thanks very much, Arturo. Um, thanks all for having me today. I know that um, it's an interesting time, and so it's an interesting time to do a presentation like this. Um, before I get started, um, I'm basically required by Moody's lawyers to make sure I always have a good disclaimer at the beginning of one of my talks. So um, I want to preface this by saying that I work for Moody's Analytics, which is an entirely separate company from Moody's Investor Service, which is the ratings agency. So please don't uh, let anything that I say today be misconstrued as having any bearing whatsoever on past, current, or future ratings actions. Um, if that sounds like it was written by a lawyer, uh, it's because it was. Uh, but it helps me keep out of trouble. Okay, um, let's move on to what we really came to talk about today, um, which is, of course, kind of the COVID-19 economy, what it means for states and local governments, and how we can kind of be working forward with this. Um, as many of you, I, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces in the or familiar names in the uh, the audience chat. Uh, I know that most of you I have met before, but uh, if you've seen me uh, speak before, what you probably are used to me saying is I try and always include some kind of funny story at the beginning of one of my talks. Um, and with this talk, I, I kind of agonized for two or three days over what I could possibly say at the beginning of this to put some context around it. Um, and this is, I think, maybe the first time I haven't been able to come up with anything. Um, two reasons for that. I think, one, you know, this is not funny. There's nothing funny about it. And uh, two, um, it's not like anything that we've seen before, so it's very difficult to put any kind of context around this whatsoever and try and wrap your arms around it. So we're going to do the best we can to move forward and kind of talk about what you all can be expecting to see from an economic perspective uh, and then talk about a couple of ways that you can kind of help to try and plan for that uh, as best you can, okay? So the very first thing I want to talk to you about is just kind of where we were just a few weeks ago and how quickly we've come to where we are. So um, if you were to see me give a talk like this just a few weeks ago, uh, you would be hearing me talk about how we were in the longest period of expansion in modern American history, about how um, you know, there's no obvious reason for a recession to come immediately, but that we would probably have another recession sometime in the next 6 to 12 months because of a variety of factors like the yield curve, and uh, the unemployment rate being below full employment. And uh, so it's not a shock, I think, to anybody that we're going to have a recession necessarily in 2020 or even 2021. I think the real shock here is that we're not having a normal recession in that there's demand kind of disappearing um, and we've got more supply than demand. The reason we're having a recession is that there's a lot of that demand that just legally cannot um, take place or that economic activity can't take place. And so instead of having this nice little coast uh, into a recession, we're really hitting a full stop. And it's uh, some of the data is like things that we just, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, you know, we haven't seen before. Um, I was uh, in a past life, I actually was a, a revenue estimator at the state of New Mexico. Um, so during the last recession, I worked for David Abbey in the Legislative Finance Committee uh, forecasting revenues. And uh, we thought that was significant. We thought that was extremely severe. Some of the data, I remember hearing, you know, David and other folks who have been through quite a few recessions say, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. Uh, well, I hate to tell you again, this is like nothing we've ever seen before. And when you look at the data itself, it, it really kind of speaks for itself. So this is unemployment insurance claims. 
historically, and I apologize if there was the, that that um, that X axis looks to be like it was truncated. They had to do some. I always have a bad habit of sending people slides that are too wide, and it looks like they they may have scrunched up my slides and, and make that up. But basically, that is history going all the way back to 1967 in that chart. So since 1967, we are multiples uh, multiple orders of magnitude above anything that we have ever seen in terms of having unemployment kick up so quickly. We've never had everything kick up so quickly. Um, in such a short period of time, and it's obviously something that's very difficult to, to deal with, something um, that the UI trust funds are going to have a very difficult time of dealing with. When we looked at um, the Department of Labor's um, basically stress test of um, state UI trust funds um, just a few months ago, um, we noticed that not everyone was in a great position, and uh, if you weren't in a great position then, you're definitely not in a great position now. So we expect to see a lot more borrowing from UI trust funds um, similar to what we saw in 2008, but on a much greater scale for a lot of states because there are some states who are going to run out of money in their UI trust funds in a matter of weeks this time instead of a matter of years. And that's, that's not a great thing to, worry, uh, to have to worry about, and so the federal government is going to definitely have to step in there. Um, just to show you kind of how, what this means in terms of some day-to-day -day, uh, activities, there's one of the reasons we're, we're kind of at a loss as economists around some of these issues is that we're, we're held captive by the data. There, because everything has happened so quickly in just a matter of, of days or weeks, it's difficult to quantify this, which is why everybody was so interested in seeing this UI uh, claim data come through. When we look at some other high, um, you know, relatively granular, um, high-frequency data points, um, we can see it as well. So this is travelers passing through TSA checkpoints. Um, just for the month of March. So you can see that we've gone through uh, from about 2.5 million travelers about this time last year to you know, basically you know, less than 500,000 travelers going through checkpoints today. If you're in a state that relies a lot on tourism, that's not a great sign. Um, same thing with retail. So if we look at um, dining out, this is seated diners. This data comes to us from uh, Open Table which is uh, a really cool that they, they put this data out there and allow us to see it. But you can see that in basically every major metro area in the country, um, there are no seated diners um, in within a, a matter of a week. So to have that kind of full stop on the economy is going to create um, issues that we really have never seen before. So what we've tried to do at Moody's is a couple of different things in terms of trying to wrap our brains around this. We've, first of all, we have... Um, basically taken all these impacts and we've tried to make them as granular geographically as we possibly can. So we've actually come up with a, a score to see which metro areas in the country are going to be the hardest hit. And again, I, I apologize if that's a little scrunched up, but um, uh, it gives you a good idea of what metro areas are going to be the most, uh, have the, the basically the most vulnerability to the type of economic downturn that we're about to see. Um, and I apologize also for including this very technical z-score. As you can imagine, things are moving pretty quickly on our end. But basically, that shows a deviation from the median. And so if you're in red, obviously you're bad. If you're in the, the dark green, then you're going to be better off in terms of the impact of this. I don't want um, this to be misconstrued as saying that the folks in green are going to do well. It just means they're going to do better than everybody else. So everybody is going to do bad across the entire country. As a matter of fact, we were just um, looking over some of our, our recession forecasts for the, the entire world. Basically, every country that we forecast, which is more than 100 countries, is scheduled to go into a recession sometime this year, which is, again, not like, not like anything we've ever seen before. Um, having no place to hide like that is really unusual, uh, really unprecedented, um, and something that we're not likely to forget anytime soon. So... Um, the, the metro areas that are going to be most at risk are going to be those who are, obviously, the larger population centers are having troubles with this. Um, anybody who relies heavily on tourism, anybody who relies heavily on trade, and anybody who relies heavily on commodities, so agricultural commodities and um, uh, energy commodities as well. We're, if you're in the energy markets, you're kind of seeing a double whammy right now. In addition to seeing all of this demand more or less just disappear globe-wide, um, we're also seeing some geopolitical issues with uh, the Saudis and the Russians in terms of uh, increasing global supply. And so there's really a double whammy onto uh, uh, oil markets that's going to really kind of pile on to a lot of the, the negative fiscal implications that we'll see 
in some of the other states this year. Now, um, now that I've thoroughly kind of bummed you all out, um, I'm going to try and put a little bit of a silver lining on this, and that the, the good thing about this is because this is following the longest period of expansion in modern American history, um, we've had a lot of time to prepare for this. And so the majority of states are in a very good position, or at least the best position they've been in the past of handling this. So at Moody's every year, we do a, uh, a stress test of state um, budgets. This, these are the results of our FY, uh, our, our fall 2019 stress testing um, exercise. Um, and you can see that the majority of states were prepared or very close to being prepared to weather the, the impacts of a moderate recession. Now, obviously, uh, a moderate recession, this won't be. Um, the, uh, the guidance that we've been giving a lot of our state clients is that the, uh, the impact of this is going to be, at a minimum, roughly 10% of uh, general fund revenues in terms of lost um, tax revenues. Uh, and then you'll probably see another couple percentage points in terms of impact from higher Medicaid spending. Now, um, for context, when we run these stress testing uh, exercises in the fall, um, there's a very broad distribution of impacts across states. So even though we may see the average state only at about 10 to, to 12 percent impact in terms of their, their revenues and their, their Medicaid program, th the distribution is very wide. So for example, in Alaska, they can see as much as a 45 to 50 percent increase, or sorry, decrease in their uh, budget balances as a result of this. Um, whereas, you know, some of the states with a bit more stable tax uh, presences like Pennsylvania or Arkansas, they usually see about a 7% um, hit to their, um, uh, their budgets as a result of a moderate recession. Um, we think that's more or less a best case estimate of where we're going to be very soon. So you know where you kind of are, your state is on that distribution if you see a, a big um, swing or if you see not very large swings uh, when we have a recession. Um, but if you're, if you're centered in any of those, those industries that I talked about earlier, so trade, um, uh, commodities, agricultural, uh, energy, uh, tourism, you're going to see a much larger impact, obviously, as a result of this. Um, on the downside of this, um, we're giving clients guidance that this is probably going to be, you know, the average state probably seeing somewhere in the range of 15 to 25 percent of a budget hit as a result of this. Um, there's a lot of, of, of uncertainty around that number, and until we get more data, it's going to be very difficult to, to make more of a, a comment around that. Um, but what we want to do, and we want to make sure that, um, that states are doing, and we're, we're already doing with a number of our clients, is we're taking um, our, our models, so your, your tax forecasters' models, your Medicaid forecasters' models, and we're stressing those already with a variety of different scenarios to figure out kind of a distribution around which we can begin to plan and which policymakers need to start thinking about. Um, so with that, let's kind of move on to kind of how we think about all this, how we look at the forecast, and how you can be implementing that forecast to help you. What I want to talk about is, first of all, um, and Erlinda hit this right on the head, we're really kind of shooting at a moving target. Okay? Everything is so in flux. Every time we think we've stressed the forecast by enough, um, two days later we realize it's just certainly not enough stress. We, shouldn't have put, we should have put even more than that in. So these are uh, our forecasts for um, the world and then a couple of key countries. Um, our January baseline, so before we really knew that COVID-19 was going to be more than a blip on the radar. Um, our March baseline where we knew things were starting to grow but we didn't quite um, fully anticipate the, the full sudden stop that we would have in economic activity. And then we've got our March update, which is a baseline that we are uh, actually just releasing today. So this is our most up-to-date um, uh, baseline forecast. And you can see that the second quarter of 22 is pretty abysmal for everywhere but China. Um, and that's because China had a pretty abysmal first quarter. So uh, things are falling. Like it, the, the magnitude of the numbers that we're seeing fall are, are like nothing that we've ever seen before. Our baseline assumption for the U.S. is that we see a very brief uh, or very small decline in GDP relatively um, in the first quarter of 2020 at minus 2 percent, and then actually a decline of minus 18 percent in the second quarter. Now, I want to uh, put some more context around that by saying that that actually 
uh, incorporates the assumptions that the bill today would pass on the House floor. So that 18% decline in, in, in second quarter GDP is net of the impacts of fiscal stimulus on the economy. That's how, how large of a, of a decline we would actually see in, uh, in Q2 GDP. If we were to take out the um, effects of the stimulus, then Q2 GDP would have fallen by roughly a quarter, all in one, in, in one period of time, which is, again, not like anything we've seen before in the U.S. Now, the good news is that with the, um, the passage of the fiscal stimulus, and depending on the success that we have in the United States of actually flattening this curve and getting beyond the peak, um, the, the majority of the, the pain um, from a, an economic standpoint should be more or less um, quarantined to the second quarter of this year. Now, that assumes as well that we have at least one more round of fiscal stimulus coming as well, um, but even that may not be enough to really get us growing again. So. Um, that's kind of just to show you how much our, our, our forecasts have moved. What I want to do now is I want to walk you through a couple of scenarios that we are thinking about, what our baseline assumptions are, kind of what we're putting behind those things, as well as um, some of the, the tails, so what could go really right and what could go really wrong around these forecast assumptions. Uh, the first is uh, kind of the epidemiological assumptions. Um, this is, again, unique in that, you know, as economists, we're, we're listening to the epidemiologists, uh, not the other way around. And uh, it's really the virus is going to be the one that tells us when things can relatively go back to normal. So our baseline forecast assumes that we have about 3 million U.S. infections. That's about one-tenth of 1% 1 of the economy, or sorry, of the, the population. Um, that we expect that new infections would peak in May, um, and then we expect that the infections would start to abate by about July. That's about roughly what we're seeing uh, in, in Italy and in China, um, and we'll talk about this in just a second, but from a timing perspective, our baseline roughly assumes that we uh, are about two weeks behind Italy in terms of the timing of when it came into uh, the country and when it will hopefully will be past kind of the, the peak of the curve. Um, now you can see what may, is a little scary about our baseline forecast is that we are really, by those assumptions, pushing the capacity of our healthcare um, uh, system. So under that um, instance, we'd have about 20% excess capacity in hospital beds, but what's really important is we'd only have about 4% in excess capacity in terms of ICU beds, which is proven to be really uh, what we're seeing globally, that's, that seems to be the main factor to keep an eye on. Now, under a, um, a, an S1 scenario, which at Moody's is, uh, if you're not one of our clients, our S1 scenario is always our more optimistic scenario. Um, it is what we would expect to happen about 10% of the time if we were to draw you know, a big uh, Monte Carlo distribution and, and do all the different probabilities of, of things happening. Um, you can see that this expects us the new infections to peak in the month of April, and from what we're getting from the epidemiologists and the experts on this is once those infections have peaked and they start to at least level off, if not decline, you're usually looking at somewhere between two to six weeks um, before life can start to resume a bit of normalcy and you can start to have people go back to work, uh, obviously not telecommuting. Um, that's really the key to watch and that's the main difference between these three scenarios and the, the number of infections. So we expect new infections to peak in May. That's our baseline forecast. The best case scenario is they peak in April, which means that we might be back to normal a bit earlier. Um, and then under the S3 scenario, which again, if you're familiar with our, our scenarios at Moody's, you'll know that's our, usually our, our moderate recession scenario. Um, right now, our moderate scenario is a pretty, pretty scary scenario. Um, and you can see that we actually exceed maximum capacity um, in terms of ICU beds and a couple of other things, which are really um, kind of some scary, um, scary scenarios to think about. Okay, but what I want to—the point I'm trying to make here with these three different scenarios—is that it really is the timing that makes a difference. And again, it is going to be um, the virus that tells us how long this lasts. So this is um, uh, active up to yesterday. This is from the Johns Hopkins data. And you can see um, this is um, kind of normalized by not only the size of the population, but also um, the number of days since 100 confirmed cases were witnessed in a country. 
And you can see we kind of are in the middle uh, when it comes to the United States. We haven't been, you know, the worst country when it comes to responding to this, but we certainly haven't been the best. Um, right now, in terms of um, the results, South Korea seems to be um, really um, exceeding everybody else's expectations. Um, they were very quick with testing. They were very quick with their response to this. And the result was they didn't have to have nearly as large of a, a widespread shutdown as we've had to have in the United States, certainly not as much as they had to have in China or Italy. Italy, obviously, is um, they're having probably the most trouble uh, of all the developed countries worldwide. Um, they've seen the, the most deaths as a share of their overall population. Uh, and what's scary here is that even though the U.S. has been able to stay below um, uh, Italy and South Korea for most of this curve, that curve is bending up very quickly. And the pace of growth that we're starting to see, we're starting to see things grow at that exponential rate that um, all of the epidemiologists have been warning us about on television. Um, if we were to continue at that rate, then our cases as a share of the population are going to be very uh, Italy-like in just a matter of days, not a matter of weeks, but a matter of days. And so um, our baseline assumption assumes that we follow that Italy trajectory and that um, by the time we level out, it's probably somewhere in mid-May, which means that we probably see very strong um, restrictions on the amount of economic activity that's allowed to happen until at least June of this year. Now, um, a couple of key scenario statistics in terms of what that actually translates to in terms of economic growth. So our baseline, again, assumes we have a recession in Q1 and Q2 of this year. Um, the peak unemployment rate would be around 9% uh, in the second quarter of 2020. Now, I want to um, add some context around that. That means that the, the quarterly average would be about 9%, which means that there will be some months in that period where there could be much higher than 9%. So I've heard some uh, people yell out numbers as high as, you know, 20 25% as part of their baseline. Um, they may go that high for one month, but it would be unlikely under those baseline epidemiological assumptions for us to have, um, you know, that high for the entire quarter. Now, that said, if we do get into the, the situation where we're on the 10% downside scenario, the S3, um, peak unemployment could be as high as 13%, and we could have a peak to trough real GDP decline of about 9%. Okay? Our baseline is right around 6%. We see the partial bounce back. Again, there's a, a big deal because of the stimulus funding um, in uh, early 2021, but then we have a very slow pace of growth kind of coming out of that. Um, you know, the best case that can happen here is a peak to trough real GDP decline of about 4%, which, again, goes to some of those, those numbers I threw around earlier where if you're a state government, you need to be, you know, expecting at least a 10% hit um, to your budget, if not more. And I would probably send your baseline assumptions considerably more than that. Um, from a policy perspective, what that means is um, under our baseline assumption, the $2.2 trillion stimulus that was passed today is enacted, um, which includes all of those great things that uh, Erlinda talked about earlier, so I won't go into too much detail about it. Um, I also, if we were going to go under that scenario, we also assume that there is some kind of stimulus in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, hopefully that would improve, include uh, additional uh, monies for states, especially, you know, enhanced FMAP percentages beyond, above and beyond what was done in phase two of the deal. Um, and the best case scenario, so this S1, in addition to all of the stimulus, in addition to good federal guidance on when we should go to work, um, there's probably going to be two potential stimulus um, uh, bills that come out of that one towards the end of this year and then one sometime in 2021 if we really want to kind of jumpstart the economy back to its the the momentum that we had uh, previously that's really going to be necessary and so um, that's what we're kind of assuming um, in terms of those three scenarios if uh, you are uh, in a state and you're worrying about your budget and you're trying to think through the different um, potential scenarios here my best advice to you um, would be to use scenarios like these or use these scenarios if you're a Moody's client, uh, run them through those models to help give you a good distribution of potential outcomes, and then uh, you can kind of try and move forward from there. Uh, we're going to continue to be kind of uh, examining these assumptions as we go on, um, but uh, this is really uh, the best we can do from a, from a planning standpoint. 
Um, Ar Arlinda talked about this in great detail, so I'm not going to go into much more, but this is the fiscal rescue package that was passed today. This is what was in it as of yesterday. We were trying to make sure that they didn't try and throw anything in today that would throw us off. But um, I want to speak very briefly about the, the stimulus package and kind of what it's intended to do and why we think it's very good news for the economy. Um, not only because of the aid that's in it for state and local governments, but from an economic perspective, there's really two things that are accomplished here. The first is um, this is going to get some money directly into Americans' pockets right away. Um, by our best math, according to this, there's about $550 million, uh, billion dollars that will go directly into um, people's pockets in the second quarter of this year. Um, if you count all the flow-throughs from the federal and the state agencies, that number probably balloons up to around $700 billion. That's ex incredibly important, not just for um, the, uh, the ability to kind of stem the economic tide, but it, it's really important for kind of instilling a little bit of a sense of normalcy, a relative normalcy for consumer spending uh, and quality of life. The, the second piece of this bill, and which I think is equally as important, is um, the structural um, pieces that are in here for states and local governments, for businesses, for adding liquidity to the market so that we don't suffer any additional structural declines um, in the economy. So the, the first piece to individuals is really to try and stimulate as much growth as we can. That's where the biggest bang for the buck is going to be. Um, that money is going to be spent um, fastest and, and it's going to go the furthest. But those structural um, uh, liquidity issues that we talked about with loans to so, uh, small businesses, the money that's being given to backstop uh, loans from the Federal Reserve, those are incredibly important towards making sure that we have a strong platform to build off of as we do those next stimulus uh, bills, uh, either at the end of this year and next year. Uh, without that strength, um, then we're going to have to do a lot more further down the line in terms of additional stimulus. Okay? Um, with that, um, Arturo, I'd be happy to hand it back over to you to uh, start handing out some questions or um, yeah. thank you Dan for that excellent insight and thank you Dan for that excellent insight uh, into the situation that everyone is facing the remaining time will now be dedicated to Q&A and remember to type in your questions in the chat box we already have several questions that have been posted um, by the audience members today and uh, we can go ahead and move over to some of these questions uh, Dan, uh, there were some questions. There were several of these questions were um, directed over to you regarding the uh, um, your presentation today, and you can see here if you can look through the audience. Um, for example, uh, there was a question here regarding: Has there been any estimates or projections created for losses to fuel consumption slash tax revenue as a result of stay-in-place orders in the U.S. Uh, that's a great question. To be honest, no, we we just don't have enough. Uh, we don't have enough data yet to really get some good uh, projections off of that. Most of the projections we've been doing so far have been based off of the large scale tax revenues, so gross receipts taxes, sales taxes, personal income taxes. Um, but those are absolutely things that we need to be um, need to be modeling off of, especially for the transit agencies. Um, there's going to be some major liquidity issues um, at below the state level, and it's something that I think states need to be incredibly aware of in addition to the federal government, um, when things kind of go off the rails without the, the government assistance, it goes off the rails usually at the local government level and uh, kind of the, the enterprise level below state governments. And so being uh, acutely aware of some of the, the liquidity issues that they're going to be running into, in addition to states and, and territories over the next few months, uh, is crucial towards making sure, again, that platform is there for us to build off of later on. Thank you, Dan. This next question is for Linda. Linda, does the CARES Act include any guidance about the roles of governors vis-a-vis -vis the state legislatures in budgeting the state's share of the $150 billion? Could a governor claim sole authority to allocate the state's share? Um, so that is that's a good question. And again, um, this, this situation continues to be sort of fluid as we figure out the administration and the implementation of these funds. Um, so I'm going to actually take a take a pass on that, not a pass, but I, I'm going to note that question as a concern, um, and make sure that we you know we analyze that and bring that forward as we move through this process. I, I don't have a an, you know a, a, a very um, secure answer for that right now, but, but but please know that we are going to have another webinar in the future to address all these implementation issues um, as well. Back to Dan with a question from Bill Glassball. 
So Dan, how do you how do you, your current scenarios compare with the worst case outcomes of your last budget stress test? Well, first of all, hi Bill. Um, second of all, um, it's going to be worse. It's going to be very different in, in the way that it hits too. So in our previous stress test, we always do an S3 and an S4. And the, the map that I showed you today is our S3, which was our moderate recession scenario. That was roughly akin to like a 1991 recession in terms of magnitude. We also run an S4 scenario, which is supposed to be the worst case, kind of akin to a great recession type scenario. This is uh, worse than that in terms of the magnitude of the decline, but it's also better than that in terms of the duration. So under an S4 scenario and what we, you would have seen in our stress test in the past, you would have seen things decline by maybe five or 6% uh, per quarter, but they would have done it for maybe six to 10 quarters. And so it would have been a very long and broad recession. This one is very much more kind of a surgical strike. It's a huge decline in GDP. I think we, as you saw 18% in that second quarter, but then things kind of bounce right back up as um, you know, economic activity is legally allowed to take place again. Um, now there's gonna be some hit to potential GDP going mm -hmm. forward as people are less confident in their ability to, you know, it, just because it's legal for me to fly to China on a business trip doesn't mean I necessarily want to do that or I feel safe enough yet until there's a vaccine that, that is available for that, uh, which is, as far as we know, still, you know, a year to 18 months away. So there's going to be some residual there, but it's going to be a very different shape of the decline than we would see in those, those S4 scenarios, which is why I think from a, from a state budget perspective, um, we should see everything much more concentrated into one or two fiscal years as opposed to really being as drawn out as maybe we would have seen the Great Recession, if that makes sense. Thank you, Dan. This next question is from Lydia Chu and Erlinda. This question is directed to you. Do we know how the distributions for local governments will work? For example, if a city over 500,000 and the county that the city is in both want direct payments, would the county's population for the formula double count that city's population? That is, uh, again, another issue that was raised um, with what we call our Big Seven um, organizations. Um, the cities have actually raised that as, as an issue with it, the implementation going forward, um, as there are some cities and some localities that, according to this formula, would be you know, almost shorted funds or the ability to apply for funds. Um, again, we are taking note of all these concerns, and uh, as we move forward with our conversations with the Treasury next week, uh, we will be you know, bringing all those to the forefront, but, but please trust and know that that is definitely an, a concern that has been raised and, and will be addressed, hopefully, um, in a way that um, still allows for the localities and, the, and those areas to receive the funds that they should be receiving. This next question is from uh, Elizabeth uh, Trilo, and it asks, have you looked at the potential for states to utilize Section 4003 emergency relief and taxpayer protections for the states to either receive loans to cover losses of revenues or, or potential issue bonds to be purchased. Erlinda? Oh, uh, that I'm question is... Uh, yeah. Either. Yeah, sorry. Um, please, I, I don't... Uh, if anyone else has a little more background on that, I'd appreciate maybe somebody okay. else could contribute on that one. Right. We can... Dang, I was hoping Erlinda would take that one. <laughs> Uh, Arthur, can follow I up looked at it enough. Yeah, I haven't looked okay. at it in enough detail, um, but obviously there's there's every state's going to be different because there are provisions around how much money can go out of the treasury and where you can you can borrow from and for how long in each state, and those are all very unique at the state level. Okay, and we will also follow. Also, just notice if you even if you post a message today, we're not able to get to it. We will follow. We will have a. Uh, repository of all these questions, and we will have a follow-up with everyone who we have been not, not able to get back to during this uh, one-hour-long uh, webinar. Um, Dan and Orlando and uh, Eric, if there's any questions you can see here in the audience chat box, I will turn it over to you. If you want to address one of these questions, we have uh, uh, probably more than we can address before the end of the webinar, but I'll go ahead and turn it over back to you. 
Uh, I won't try and, and dive into too many of these in great detail, but again, we will try and get back to each one of these written down. But if there are any specific questions that folks have uh, or you're unsure how to get it, you can always uh, contact us at Moody's, at daniel.white at moody's.com or help at economy.com. Um, we're happy to uh, help you guys uh, answer any of those questions, so uh, please don't be shy by reaching out. We're here to help. Erica, there's a question for you here. Where do states, this is from Matthew Holmes, where do states stand on their current rainy day fund slash reserve funding given the revenue shortfalls that are expected? Uh, well, overall, we've seen rainy day funds um, really bounce back since the Great Recession. I think they are about, uh, we typically look at year-end balances, which are date closing balances plus rainy day funds. I think they're around 10% nationally. Um, we haven't seen, we've seen a few states dip into their rainy day funds so far, but so far we haven't seen too much action on that. Okay, thank you, Erica. Let's see. This is a question from John Gentry. What do the epidemiological assumptions say about infections over the next 12 months? Should we expect infections to continue until 70% of the country is infected? Perhaps that might be, I'll leave that open. Um, well, not not being an epidemiologist, I, I couldn't say for certain, but all okay, of the, we the advice that we've gotten, yeah, all the ones that we've gotten have said that anything close to that would be un, almost in, in, almost impossible. You never want to say impossible with this. I think the, the worst case scenarios that we're seeing from folks are instances where, again, maybe four or five percent of the country gets infected and nothing in the magnitude of, of 70 percent. Dan, another question for you. Can we get the S4 scenario? This is from Grant White. Maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll reach out to Grant uh, individually. We can we can chat about that. Okay. We're we're actually, and I should mention this, Arturo. We're in the process. We we do that uh, the stress testing exercise in the fall. We're in the process of doing a special stress test exercise now with our COVID-19 scenarios, so those S1, S3 scenarios, and, and potentially the S4 scenario. Okay. As we can, right uh, and expect to have a, a paper out in the next week or two kind of going over that in detail. Erlinda, this question is from Michael Bezanson. Do you know when the Treasury will release further guidance for states? Um, we are hoping, uh, hoping, and again, this is all just, um, you know, until it happens, it happens. Early next week is when we hope to, to get some more uh, information and some guidance from Treasury regarding um, the administration of these funds. And also, let me just also say, um, and, and um, Dan had mentioned it before about the, the, uh, the need for maybe further stimulus in the future. Um, you know, I know that there, there are ha also talks happening now about a, a, almost a stimulus four package. Um, so there, are, you know, again, this again, nothing is set in stone, but there have been some serious discussions with you know the other big seven organizations and the big five, the financial five, we call them as well, about you know addressing some of these other issues, structural issues, as we move forward into the months now and, and, and seeing what will, will be necessary for states and localities and, and the rest of our country to kind of handle this economic the fallout from the, from the crisis. So, um, I, you know, I have the sense that we, we're not done necessarily from what, what the federal government will be doing to, to help um, everyone here. But, but, yes, as far as Treasury is concerned, we do, we do expect and hope um, at least from the, the conversations we've had today and, and earlier on this week, that Treasury will be tr is has been tracking, of course, closely and does expect to to issue some clearer, um, you know, regulations and guidance on, on the funds. And and again, we do. It is our expectation to continue to keep you all informed as these things develop minute by minute. So I apologize if some of the information today I w uh, you know was not able to provide was, was spot on. But we're we're working to get as much clarity as possible. Thank you. Okay. We are now at one hour into our webinar, and we will hold there. Uh, and I want to take this time again to thank our presenters again for sharing their time and expertise in today's webinar. In the next week or so, we will be posting the recording and slides on our webpage. I would like to thank you all for your participation, and please stay well. Again, we will be following up on all the questions that were unanswered um, via email. So again, thank you so much, and have a good day.